Welcome back to the Morning Brief and top on the brief this morning, starting with the economy as the administration looks to ways to make things move faster at the ports. The president has inaugurated a steering committee for the National Single Window Project. This initiative is aimed at providing a comprehensive trade facilitation system in Nigeria and ensure faster cargo clearance at the seaports. We cannot afford to lose an estimated $4 billion in U.S. dollars annually to red tape, bureaucracy, delays and corruption at our ports. The national single window we are there thieves issues headlong, preventing revenue leakage and facilitating effective trade by doing so. We will create a more transparent, secure a business-friendly environment that will attract investment and spur economic growth. This initiative will serve as a catalyst for achieving an average GDP growth rate of 7% annually, propelling Nigeria to new heights of prosperity. Paperless trade alone is projected to bring an annual economic benefit of around 2.7 billion USD a testament to the transformative power of this initiative. In terms of opening the, the, the land borders, consultations are already in progress, some of them at very high level. Uh, over the last weekend, I was, uh, I had an interaction with my colleagues in the Benin Republic. Earlier, I had gone to our borders in the Niger Republic. We are looking at the issues that led to the closures of the border in the first instance. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, is reviewing its economic projection growth upward for Nigeria for the year 2024 to 3.3% from its earlier 3.2%. Speaking during the release of the World Economic Outlook on the ongoing IMF World Bank Spring Meetings in Washington, D.C., the director of the research department of the fund also projected a downward trend in the country's inflation rate to 23% later in the year and 18% in 2026. Inflation continues to come down. Median inflation will decline from 4% at the end of last year to 2.8% by the end of this year and 2.4% at the end of 2025. And most indicators continue to point to a soft landing. Now, resilient growth and rapid disinflation are consistent with favorable supply developments, including the fading of energy price shocks and a striking rebound in labor supply, supported by strong immigration in many advanced economies. In Nigeria, steady but actually rising this year from 2.9% last year to 3.3% this year. Uh, we've seen uh, an expansion from the recovery in the oil uh, sector with a better security situation and also improved agriculture, uh, benefiting from the better weather conditions and the introduction of dry season farming. Uh, so there's a, a broad-based increase also in the uh, financial sector and the IT sector. Uh, inflation, yes, it uh, it has increased. Uh, part of this reflects the, the reforms, the exchange rate, um, and it's passed through into other uh, goods, from imports to other goods. So this explains also why we revised up our inflation projection for this year to 26%. And with the kickoff on the, of the IMF and World Bank spring meetings in Washington, D.C., debt and climate finance are back on the agenda. Nigeria's delegation is being led by the Minister of Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy, who emphasizes the need for the country to ensure it registers its voice as an important country in Africa and the world. He spoke with our London correspondent, Juliana Olainka. Nigeria has to be at the table. Nigeria has to have its voice heard as, a, as an important country, not just in Africa, but in the world, given the size, the uh, population, the resource endowment of the country, and of course, um, it is uh, one of the largest democracies in the world, which is a, also a very important factor. It gives us an opportunity on the world stage in front of the most important uh, financial decision makers, and of course the whole world is watching, the private sector in particular is, uh, takes their signals from some of the conversations that go on. And it's an opportunity to uh, showcase 
the achievements of the macroeconomic reform process of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu is an op opportunity to um, say what has been done so far and also to indicate the direction of travel in which we are going and give people an indication of um, where things are likely to go next. And of course, although it's early days yet, it is a success story in the sense that um, the president set out, first of all, to stabilize the economy that he met, which was one, as we know, that was uh, uh, very lopsided. It was one that uh, the financial situation was unsustainable. The fuel subsidy spending uh, generally was um, way out of line with the revenues. And as we have seen, particularly in terms of uh, what the central bank has done in stabilizing the exchange rate, uh, um, together with uh, the help of the rest of the economic team, the security uh, um, network also came in to play an important role in removing uh, some of the uh, wrongdoing and some of the illegality that also uh, was, was putting pressure on the exchange rate. And of course, on the fiscal side, uh, on the government side, on the government revenue spending, uh, uh, um, uh, spending side, we took a leaf from what Central Bank indicated and have helped to um, raise interest rates to a level where we've been able to attract foreign exchange liquidity that has stabilized the foreign exchange uh, rate, or in fact reversed its free fall is the best way to put it. Away from the economy now, the Minister of Water Resources and Sanitation says part of the 148 local government areas in 31 states of the Federation fall within the high flood risk areas. He said this during the public presentation of the 2024 annual flood outlook for Nigeria at the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency in Abuja. Meanwhile, at a separate event, Minister of Agriculture and Food Security, Mr. Bubakar Kiari, asked farmers to take advantage of the seasonal rainfall prediction to increase agricultural produce in the country. Let us and annual flood outlook publications with maps have been dispatched to the governors while the exact local governments to be affected in each state and the expected level of flood are detailed out accordingly. Regrettably, there have been farming seasons in Nigeria when farmers did not take advantage of the institutional advice from NIMIT and on their own misread the rainfall pattern only to face dry spells that invariably ruin their crops and livelihoods. And security operations in Kassina State may have received a boost with the launch of 10 armored personnel carrier vehicles to support the ongoing joint operation led by the police, the army and the Kassina Security Watch Corps across eight local government areas of the state. Speaking at the launch, Governor Diku Rada pledged to continue to support the conventional security agents in the state in their onslaught against terrorists. I have uh, walked the talk uh, by providing all the necessary equipment needed to Katsina Community Watch as well as the joint operation led by the police. You know, this insecurity issue is an issue that we have inherited and as an issue that has come and become a hot banner during our campaign uh, activities. And uh, we have promised the people of Katsina State of our willingness to provide all the necessary skills, tactics and strategies to provide the necessary security in our place. And uh, we thank God the Katana Community Watch has been in operation for about uh, seven months now. And uh, we were very thankful to Almighty Allah to the achievements so far recorded. We cannot claim a total elimination of banditry and criminality in my state but we want to assure people that a lot has been achieved 
from the beginning of the operation, a joint operation between the Katana Community Watch and the Nigerian police with the military. In fact, a lot of things have been achieved, but we are still having challenges in some of these frontline local governments. Uh, Bandit have been going to villages, killing people uh, unnecessarily, uh, killing them and running away, and then burning some of their properties. These are things that we are now confronted with, and these are things that the state government is doing everything possible to stop. Over 300,000 kilograms and 40,000 liters of illicit substances seized from various parts of Lagos and Ogun states have been destroyed by the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency and DLEA. The heap of illicit substances was publicly set ablaze in Badagri, Lagos State, in the presence of the Chairman, Chief Executive Officer of the agency, Brigadier General Buba, Buba Marwa, and other top officials of the agency. The drugs were seized by operatives of the agency across different formations from January 2022 until date. These illicit substances were seized from various parts of Lagos in the metropolis at the seaports, airports and land borders. We use occasions such as this as an opportunity to appreciate our international partners, especially the American Drug Enforcement Administration, USDEA, the United Kingdom, NCA, National Crime Agency, the UK Border Force, the Germans, the French, Indian, NCB, among others who have worked with us on a member of on a number of crime busts. Nigeria's foreign exchange reserves have taken a sharp hit, dropping by about $1.84 billion in just 26 days as the Central Bank of Nigeria intensifies efforts to stabilize the Naira. As of April the 12th, data from the Apex Bank reveals reserves standing at $32.61 billion, a significant decline from the $34.45 billion recorded in March the in March this year. Analysts believe the decline can be attributed to the CBN's active interventions in the FX market to bolster the Naira. And outside our shores, jury selection has resumed on day two of former U.S. President Donald Trump's long-awaited hush money trial in New York, marking the first time that a U.S. president former or current, has faced a criminal trial. Six jurors have been chosen so far, but dozens of potential jurors have been excused after saying they could not be impartial. The judge has reprimanded Trump for muttering at a potential juror and has also warned his lawyers over their line of questioning. Trump is accused of trying to cover up a $130,000 hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election Election, which he won. Trump is also accused of falsifying his business records by saying the reimbursement money he gave Cohen was for legal fees. Sports News now. Kylian Mbappe scored twice as Paris Saint-Germain thrashed Barcelona to turn around the first leg deficit and reach the semi-finals of the Champions League. PSG has trailed 3-2 after the first leg in, the, in France, but reached the last four for the first time since 2021, following a chaotic encounter in Spain. Luis Enrique's side will face Borussia Dortmund in the semi-final after they beat Atletico Madrid 5-4 on aggregate in a thrilling encounter in Germany. In the meantime, Borussia Dortmund reached their first Champions League semi-finals in 11 years by producing a superb second-half comeback to beat Atletico Madrid 5-4 on aggregate. Yes, so many surprises from the Premiership scene. Uh, there are more surprises, uh, you know, from what, some of what you're saying about the top stories. Speaking of which, Kaede joins me now. Uh, hello, Kaede. So what resonates... Uh, with you. you. You're losing touch on your football <laughs> thingy. You've not been watching football. You know, during the Nations Cup, you were hands-on. Okay, so I should watch more of it. You should watch more of it. Okay. You know? so, so you know that it's the European League and okay. not the Premier League. Okay. It was UCL last night and it was a very big night. Bukola has this very brilliant football mind. <laughs> <laughs> when, 
<laughs> when she's you're ready very, for you're it. You're very kind, when, got it. I mean, Thank you. We've had very good ratings of Bukola. We're considering, do we loan you out to the sports desk? That's but, great. We'll think about that later because you're too valuable <laughs> to us. But speaking of what is trending this morning, bag of rice has been big in the news. But, you know, it ties back to uh, what's happening with the Forex, right? We've seen how uh, the value of the Naira has improved against the dollar in recent weeks. And there's been a lot of conversation around when this will trickle down to other products. We had that conversation yesterday. But behind this big conversation is our Forex Reserve. And that's where we're starting with uh, this morning. Well, the news came out yesterday that Nigeria's Foreign Reserve shed $2.16 billion in 29 days. And that got a lot of people asking, or wondering what exactly is going on. Oh, is this why this is happening? But let's see what Nigerians are saying, are about saying that yeah. this morning. And we start with um, O L or Lawali. I think that's the username on X. But the name is Mushibolatum, but the handle is O L Lawali. It says less than fifty million dollars has been sold to BDCs since the central bank started intervening in the forex market. It says I doubt the depletion of the reserves has anything to do with the defense of the Naira. And you see tagging the CBN governor and saying that he should at this point explain the reason or reasons for the depletion. Mm. So we should take a closer look, you oh, know, yeah. at um, uh, how much the CBN is releasing mm. as against the depletion of uh, the foreign reserves. Absolutely. You know, particularly, um, you know, now that uh, this, the, the, the NNPC is, you know, reporting increase in revenue from crude oil sales. So that's very instructive from very. Olawali. This one is from Red Cap Chief, who also says, we still have $32.29 billion left. Fire That's down. a setup. The next name is a setup. Okay. So you, you should skip it. Because okay. it's trying, I, I know what the user is trying to do, but go ahead. Okay, so it. I'll skip it. Thank you know, you there's some landmines <laughs> on social media these days. Uh, but you know what, you, you get the point of that user. Uh, you can go ahead. Okay, so he says, the goal. the goal is one dollar to one Naira. After that, we change our name to... <laughs> I don't know if this is patriotic, but he says, change our name to USN and rub shoulders with America. That's United States of Nigeria, right? Okay. 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 There's a lot of sarcasm in that post, by the way. A lot of it. Uh, but Huge dose of it, actually. Huge dose of it. Uh, but we understand the lingo on social media. Well, the next one is from um, Alex O.K. Obasi, and also about this one says, Oh, yes, better we use our FX reserves to defend Naira and reduce inflation. We possess lands and cars in case of challenges tomorrow. You sell it and solve your problems. Life continues. Okay. I, I see we are doing a lot of sarcasm this morning, or not. It's really hard to tell sometimes, but that's yeah. what this user thinks. But we must, you know, what happens to our shock absorber? So yeah. that goes back to the conversation about creating value, you know, such that we can also even increase our Absolutely. forex reserves and not rely on our forex reserves yeah. to defend the Naira. Uh, so um, on to the next conversation, which is about uh, the EFCC's activities, you know, seen in the uh, arraignment of Pascal Chibike Okechuku, popularly known as Kubana Chief Priest, on Wednesday Still for like, abuse of the Naira. Oh, and yes. that has got a lot of Nigerians talking. Uh, let's do some of what you're saying. This one is from X Plus, uh, the handle release, Amda um, Zuriel. And uh, they say, yes, this is a good step to revive the value of Naira. If you don't value that, you have what you have, how do you expect others to value it? All those that keep breaking laws should know that once the executive arm of government decide to empower the judiciary, they will be in serious mess. Oh yes, so we're looking forward to uh, that arraignment today, by the way, Wednesday, and it's uh, what three count charge uh, was dated uh, 4th of April, Rutimu Yidipu and other lawyers for the chairman of the EFCC and that uh, Okechiku Pascal on February the 13th, 2024 at a hotel, Victoria Island, Lagos, within the jurisdiction of this honorable court, whilst dancing during a social event, tampered with funds in the denomination of 500 Naira issued by the CBN by spraying it and you thereby committed an offense contrary and punishable under section 21.1 of the CBN Act 2007. So that's count one of the three uh, count charges. But today is going to be a big day, definitely. First, it was um, Idris or Olaru Waju.
which a lot Okunaya. of people know as Okune, rather. Yeah. Uh, which a lot of people know as Bob Risky and now uh, Kubana Chief Priest. But this next uh, post is about um, education and it's a very interesting one from this user Lynn Cardinal says, Dear EFCC, do you know that 99% of Nigerians never knew they were committing a crime by spraying nuts? Well, maybe your data is really questionable because I know a good number of Nigerians who have knowledge of that particular law. Absolutely. And I've seen some Nigerians, politically exposed Nigerians actually, yeah. who would rather put the money in an envelope, you know, and um, hand it over even during the merriment. Yeah to the celebrant. Uh, so that's a more responsible way of doing things. But they may have a point about quite a number of Nigerians, a handful who abuse the Naira, and you would not see it done in other parts of the country. So there should be a better way of doing things. Other, other parts, parts of the of world, the world yeah, rather. Yeah. And I figured that. And this is a suggestion from Lynn Cardinal. How about a sensitization campaign before all these prosecutions? If it were like this, over 80% of Nigerians would be in jail. So, as a part of your statement, absolutely. Because there's a lot of people who have been found wanting, and there are videos across board of politicians, uh, you know, those who are politically exposed, prominent people abusing the Naira in this way. So, we'll need, obviously, a larger correctional facility or at least a bigger court to prosecute all of these cases. But ignorance is never an excuse uh, when it comes to law. It is never an excuse. As far as mm -hmm. it is a law, then you're expected to know as a citizen of that country. So uh, that's what Lynn Cardinal thinks about this. But he also speaks to this point, Bukola. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to bring out Naira at parties to give either musicians or entertainers. Why? Well, it's a Nigerian thing. It's a Nigerian culture. Nigerians are very loud. That's the closest you know, to an answer that I can provide. I, I'm not trying to, to spoil question. business for entertainers <laughs> or anything. But why? Is it a, a show of thing? Because you know what happens is the entertainers, they psych you. And I have to use yeah. that term again. Uh, well, it's a, a, more, more appropriately, a pray, we have a praise singing culture. Mm. So either for the entertainer or for, well, it's done more for the celebrant and for the big guys who yeah. show up at parties, you know. And it's a time to demonstrate their, for, for lack of better description, big, big manness. Big manness, right. <laughs> I mean, you have to put these terms in from time to time. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this will curb some of those excesses because you don't find that in other climbs, as mm -hmm. you have said, Kola. And these climbs seem to be doing quite well. So if you were to, you know what, I don't want to spoil business for anybody, but this is a time for all of us to introspect. And of course, we'll bring you uh, the arraignment when it happens uh, today in about a couple of hours. Absolutely. So stay, stay tuned to Channels Television for that. There's more on this subject matter, and this time it's from DJ Daly, who says the EFCC needs to educate people more on the Naira issue first. Well, I think we've taken that. Um, Have we? Well, no, it just sounds like the previous one. Yeah, it one, sounds like the previous yeah. one. Make more awareness for the general public on the matter rather than just making scapegoats out of the few selected individuals by punishing them for an offense they're not aware of that they were actually committing. Uh, well, would that be a tenable excuse in the light of the circumstances? As I said, ignorance is never an excuse. Ne never an excuse. Really. excuse. But there's a tweet you want to see, and that is a tweet that we're going to put up next. It is from Ola Dapo Miki One. That's which you've wanted to see. Uh, let's see. Um, from X. <laughs> so it starts by saying, This is sounding interesting already. But then goes on to say, Hope the EFCC will do the same to politicians too, because there are endless videos of politicians abusing the Naira too. So that is a post that mm. I'm sure you've been looking forward to mm. seeing mm. about this particular conversation. Mm. Yes, in fact, we've seen governors spraying the Naira, throwing it out of their vehicles, as though the Naira During had political campaigns, you right? Know, flinging it here and there, uh, some people even dancing and stepping on it, and it just goes to show how prevalent this has become. But guess what, Bukala? Over the weekend, you know, I witnessed some celebrations, and you could see people respecting the Naira with such reverence. Nobody spraying the Naira. Even the, uh, the entertainer, had to make a note, had to announce that please, please, mm -hmm. please let us respect the Naira and do this appropriately. There are other ways you can actually... L let me take a guess. Yeah. Uh, that's a journalist um, event. 
an event or uh, an event by journalists? No, no, actually, it was it was just a, a normal event. Okay. I see where this is going. <laughs> journalists aren't the only knowledgeable people. Yes, okay. they unwind from time to time and yeah. they bring in their knowledge. You know what Bukola said to me up this well, morning. Be before, before we leave that tweet, yeah. you know, this is a call to uh, the FCC, a call to action rather, that you know their treatment of this subject matter should not be an animal farm situation. Mm. So if they're prosecuting other Nigerians, uh, they should go after the politicians as well. So it'll be interesting to see how the FCC treats this. Yeah. It's so, not so much to ask, yeah. really. We should ensure that nobody is above the law and actually mean it and act in that light. So, we're well, on to the next subject matter, oh, which yes. is the disbursement of 200 billion naira per team. Yeah. Kari, do you have the first? Oh, yes. I think this um, naturally will get a lot of people excited uh, because it's been a long time coming. Some of these promises were made as far back as uh, mid last year, you know, when the president had to address uh, the country and talk about some of the things he has in store after removing uh, petrol subsidies. So, this uh, appears to be the next in line after a long wait. And take a look at what uh, this first user has to say about this. By the way, we're moving on uh, from this case to another one. It says that, uh, where did FG get the loan? FG should rather reduce the pump price of PMS nationwide to bring down inflation, fix our refineries for them to be working optimally, fix our electricity to be working 24 hours, and see how development will spring forth. Oh, well, that'll be interesting to see. This next one is from Opsi Ops, who says, stop all these palliatives and regenerate the power sector so that many industries would not collapse. And we've seen quite a number of divestments from the country, which was a sad one. Um, they continue by saying, we need more industries so unemployment would reduce. I think this palliative is a system of stealing our commonwealth. Well, you know, sometimes you can't help but um, accommodate or allow the expression of this skepticism yeah. when you consider the uneven distribution of uh, these palliatives. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see uh, some states distributing palliatives and you see, you know, very few of that activity going on in other states of the Federation, you wonder, uh, you know, what, uh, where the budget for the palliatives has gone. Absolutely. And people have seen these things in the past. They've seen how they went. So naturally the skepticism will be there. But this next user focuses on uh, the industrial aspect of things and the cost of production. And this user, IKO Real 2005, speaks about how this is great, but it will only work provided that the operating conditions, I imagine the enabling environment, are there. And it talks particularly about manufacturers and how diesel takes up a large chunk of their costs and naturally uh, their profit. So, says that these costs are apparently also passed on to citizens, which contributes to the living cost crisis. Uh, I know that Dangote is now in the mix mm -hmm. with diesel and the price uh, is coming it's down. projected yeah. to come down. We know that the Association of the Energy Market, as I believe that's their nomenclature, is expressing optimism that there will be a slash in the price of diesel. I think it's 1,700 naira currently. Well, it's even been litter. reported that um, he slashed it to 1,000 naira per liter. Per liter. Uh, so we saw the rollout mm. uh, two days ago, slash yesterday, and it's reported that now that is the price and it's been reported widely. So will that move the needle a lot? Obviously, it should if at least it trickles down eventually to those who need it and they get it at that appropriate price. Yeah, moving the needle all the way yeah. to um, the price of commodities. You and I. Yeah. <laughs> Everyday Nigerians. Yeah, right? especially for Kadi, you know, who keeps talking to us about <laughs> you know, all of those provisions and what they cost in the market. Kadi, do you go to the market, by the way? Absolutely. Once mm. in a blue moon. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this next one is from... Iken, Iken Na Oche, who says, these programs are great, but will only work provided operating conditions are enabling. Manufacturers have just announced that diesel takes up 80% of their profits. These costs are apparently also passed on to citizens, which contributes to the living cost crisis. Oh yeah, and um, essentially reiterating the one I took earlier, that's it. And uh, Daddy Chelsea uh, is next with this one, saying, uh, I hope it will be transparent and open. And again, I imagine that's a post you want to see regarding this palliatives. Transparency, accountability, and all. Says no hidden agenda from government officials. 
Like what we saw with COVID-19's disbursement, it's interesting because the EFCC, mm -hmm. we all know the EFCC is investigating the Humanitarian Affairs Ministry, ministry. Uh, from the previous uh, ministers, the suspended minister, then the SIPA head as well. And they said that they are actually also investigating a COVID-19 uh, fund disbursement scheme. Yes, they said they've not cleared anyone, but when you read that statement and see the quantum of funds that have been recovered and what has been investigated, mm -hmm. Nigerians are, are right on the money when they say they are skeptical and they want this to be transparent. Yeah, let's have all of the details yes. and perhaps, you know, a publishing as well of those who are culpable um, in the investigation. And this last one on that subject matter is from Dami uh, Handel, Adebanjo underscore Jami, who says, Many registered for this scheme but didn't even receive verification code. I don't know what the minister is doing. It's pertinent to solve the issue of verification first before disbursement. I know of many who didn't even receive verification notice. So this is instructive in the absence of a superintending official over that ministry. And there had been a lot of um, uh, reports about um, you know, a cleaning up of the register, uh, you know, but before the suspension of the minister of that uh, ministry, uh, had we seen the publication of the register? I doubt that we had seen, seen it, you know, but uh, it's instructive to ask uh, first, you know, the register, how many households are receiving this? And uh, so that we know that indeed there is a judicious uh, disbursement yeah. of a whopping 200 billion naira. Palliative and just to target or direct this at the appropriate uh, ministry, so this is uh, for the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. We understand the Bank of Industry will be involved in this one. So I imagine this particular message is for the Minister of um, Trade or Industry, Trade and Investment, Doris Anite, about this um, what verification code, because this money is targeted at you know businesses, producers and the rest. And this is someone tell you that um, they've registered for this scheme but didn't even receive verification code. So, Minister, please take this up. I will, of course, be following up on it. All right. So, there's an interesting one that I would have loved us to cover, but we're totally... Rice. Yeah, the we, bag of rice. We have to take, even if it's one, the bag of rice. Uh, well, it's been said that the bag of rice has dropped uh, from 84,000 plus to 60-something thousand. Some say as low as 60,000. So, let's just take one for you. And this user says... Let it keep dropping. Since dollar is dropping, let all the prices of commodities drop as well. This is only way we can truly celebrate the downfall come on, <laughs> of the dollar. But hey, it's okay. Let's we'll celebrate the uptick of the Naira rather than the downfall of any currency. So we're starting off with our, the first leg of our conversation right after this time out. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Absolutely. Subject to the rule of law.
Welcome back to the program. Mr. Michael Luagbemi joins us on the program. We want to talk about the issue of CNG. He's the program director and chief executive of Presidential CNG Initiative. You heard about this a long time ago, and now the man who needs to give us all the answers is right here. Mr. Luagbemi, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Good morning. So let's begin with the natural question, I guess, that Nigerians are asking. How far with the CNG initiative? What stage are we? Uh, what is going on? When are we supposed to see things rolling out? Uh, thanks once again for having me, and good morning to your listeners and viewers. Uh, six months ago, the president announced the formation of the presidential CNG initiative uh, with... Uh, uh, Dr. Zaka Didiji as the chairman of the steering committee and, uh, of course, the empowerment of our, of, our, of our management team led by myself. And uh, we had, our promise was very straightforward uh, to implement the vision of the president for alternative vehicle by ensuring the rollout and adoption of um, uh, alternative energy for, to power the transportation sector, uh, specifically natural gas and EVs and also to then uh, incentivize the uh, disadoption by rolling out various programs and helping to distribute the various assets, uh, including conversion kits and uh, CNG tricycles and uh, 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 buses that will be acquired by the Federal Ministry of Finance uh, upon the arrival. In addition to these, uh, to ensure that financial incentives and funding to develop CNG infrastructure across the country, and EV infrastructure across the country is made available over a long term, while also ensuring the regulatory framework for CNG adoption is made available for the country in order for businesses to flourish under a predictable regulatory environment. Uh, we've been hard at work uh, since the month of uh, November. We've been not just been engaged with the sector and developing a plan for energy transition in the transport sector, but right out of the bat in the month of December, we rolled out some critical incentives that were approved by Mr. President, including VAT and uh, import duty waiver for the sector that had been worked on, welcomed by a number of investors. Uh, we also rolled out the uh, partnership with the private sector that have led to attracting over $50 million worth of investments just since the last four months. Uh, that is now currently developing uh, at least uh, over... Uh, 80 CNG sites, including a couple that were launched last week, uh, last weekend actually in Ibadan, with one of our major partners, uh, that's the Bovas uh, company, and, uh, company and Limited. And uh, this is just one of many realizations of the promises of Mr. President. Uh, we are beginning to see the development of conversion centers across Nigeria. Uh, with less than seven of them at inception just six months ago, we have over 40 of them currently, and uh, continue to grow. Uh, we have uh, more than 100 pending applications with NMPDRA for installation and development of CNG refueling stations. A number of CNG mother stations have been developed also. Uh, NIPCO has three and a number of partners, including outcome of a meeting that we had just earlier this week with gas suppliers and mainstream players. A number of them are developing these mother stations as well as daughter stations to distribute CNG across the country. These are one of many uh, outcomes of the work that we've been doing in the last months. We've also ruled out 80 critical legislations, uh, regulations, uh, working with our partners at Standard Organization of Nigeria to enable uh, auto vehicle conversions that will allow vehicles to run on both PMS and CNG upon conversion, but ensure that these conversions are done safely, reliably, and that they can utilize, vehicles can now utilize the much cheaper option of running on CNG. Uh, these uh, programs are ongoing, and we expect in the next uh, couple of months, our partners at the Federal Ministry of Finance will begin to deliver the critical assets I mentioned. Over 20,000 conversion kits that were distributed through our over 20 affiliate partners across the country, uh, located in about uh, 18 states, uh, uh, more than uh, 5,500 uh, tricycles and uh, uh, CNG buses that will also be distributed through, uh, to uh, private sector uh, transport operators and uh, um, uh, labor union uh, affiliated uh, 
uh, operators that will enable us to have these vehicles running across the country. Again, uh, a journey of a thousand miles start with the first step, but I think we are in the right direction. Uh, we are galvanizing critical stakeholders, including uh, even the academia. Uh, we're working with over 10 universities to roll out a campus equivalent of this program once we receive these assets from the Ministry of Finance. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, uh, unions, including URTW, URTN, and NATO, to ensure that the road transport unions and operators are tuned to the requirements of the sector and open to converting the vehicles to run on natural gas. Nigeria is a gas country. We are blessed with gas. There's no reason why we continue to depend solely on uh, PMS and diesel. Uh, the reality is that countries like Japan, you know, since 1984, had converted their commercial fleet to gas. And this gas was sourced from Nigeria. Then they used that gas to manufacture vehicles made with PMS and diesel and then turn around to export that to Nigeria. So it's about time Nigeria starts using our natural resources as a competitive advantage, and that's what we had to do to enable. Uh, quite a, uh, some ground that the presidential initiative has covered there. But I was also hoping that uh, you would touch on um, progress on that announcement by Mr. President uh, nearly nine months ago now, I believe, at the time of the setting up of the initiative, that uh, there would be purchase of... Um, uh, CNG-powered buses, you know, particularly after the removal of fuel subsidy, and for which the Senate is, as a matter of fact, uh, investigating, uh, saying that uh, the 100 billion naira uh, was approved without, um, I believe, uh, uh, outside the budget. Also, uh, what's the update on the panel's inquiry into the release of these funds? Uh, according to the Senate, it's saying that there is, a, there is a plan to blackmail the panel's inquiry into the project. So what's the, the update on the Senate's investigation into the release of these funds? And uh, how far with the purchase of CNG-powered buses by the initiative? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, there's no, um, for, for, for us on the, at the presidential initiative, we are utilizing the 100 billion naira assigned for this program under the 500 billion naira palliative program that was uh, approved by the National Assembly. So there's no question in my mind that uh, uh, that 500 billion appropriation, 100 billion of which was approved for CNG and it's been implemented by the acquisition of the assets, as, as I've said, is being implemented by the Federal Ministry of Finance. Uh, the initiative side of the work, which is our work, is to utilize those assets that have been acquired. And we're still waiting for the acquired assets. Uh, of course, you know the procurement law. There's, the Federal Ministry of Finance will comply with the law of the land. And so they are complying, but it takes time. And it takes time for things to be acquired and for them to arrive. So I do not know, I do, I do not understand why anyone will say that uh, the 100 billion era was suddenly coming from somewhere that was not uh, envisaged. Uh, it's just like the 200 billion you mentioned, which is a component of the, in your last uh, spill, which is a component of the palliative, and that one was devoted to SMEs. I mean, it's, it's been managed by the Federal Ministry of uh, Industry, Trade and Investment. The 100 billion component for CNG is being managed primarily by the Federal Ministry of Finance, and we are expecting those assets uh, typically, procurement takes between six to nine months, and I believe we, are, we should be expecting the first set of assets in the next 30 to nine, uh, 60 days. And then uh, our side of the, uh, of the work, which is uh, we are the end user, will be to then uh, figure out how to distribute those assets, finance those assets, and make sure those assets get into the hands of those that will use it. But the asset by themselves do not work. You need infrastructure. So the work we've been doing in the last six months is to make sure that those infrastructure are on ground, and those infrastructure are not going to be built with government money. They'll be built with the private sector investment. And that requires you to ensure you have regulation in place. Uh, that requires you to ensure that you encourage the private sector to bring their funds in place. That in involves us to, to actually start uh, stimulating demand uh, organically so that it's not just dependent. Uh, maximum government can enable maybe 30,000 natural gas vehicles with an investment of 100 billion era, if we, if we look at it critically. But 30,000 natural gas vehicles is not enough to create the sector, you need another 250, 300,000. And the private sector needs to come in to do that investment. So our work as an initiative in the last six months has been to create the enabling environment for the private sector to participate. The 100 billion era is only a down payment by the federal government towards the future that is green, that is gas, that is EV. 
Um, and that, of course, that fund is being utilized speci for specific purposes. Acquisition of CNG buses just being one of them. Um, acquisition of CNG tricycles for the bottom of the pyramid being another. Acquisition of uh, CNG uh, uh, converted kits that will allow you to convert your existing PMS vehicles to natural gas hybrid uh, is also another component of that program. And that's what constitutes the 100 billionaire. And uh, so uh, that is being done, like I said, and we're expecting to receive those assets. It is not being done by us. It is being done by the Federal Ministry of Finance as appropriated by the National Assembly. Uh, so the committee might be looking at the wrong place, I think. So you're saying that the purchase of the buses is not being handled by the uh, presidential initiative on CNG, but by the Ministry of Finance? Absolutely. That is being done under appropriation by the Ministry of Finance. The uh, presidential CNG initiative, an initiative out of the office of the president, uh, does not undertake uh, a procurement of assets. Uh, but can you tell us what component of that fund uh, will cover the purchase of the CNG buses and the CNG powered tricycles? How much of the 100 billion naira? Oh, you have to speak to the Minister of Finance for details. That's, again, that's within their own purview. Uh, but I do believe that we're expecting uh, at least uh, at the first phase of the program about 500 buses and about uh, 5,000 tricycles. Uh, just before we, we exit this matter, how true is it that uh, there are quite a number of buses that are waiting um, uh, importation to Nigeria in Germany, about 65 of them, and it is, you know, some... Uh, administrative issues about um, bringing them into the country that is delaying uh, the importation of those buses into Nigeria? I'm not aware of that and I don't think it's part of this program. Uh, and let's put this in very clear context. I know the Ministry of Finance uh, strategy for the acquisition of buses to make sure that those buses are actually assembled in Nigeria. That includes tricycles. So I don't think they will be subject to this kind of delays you're talking about. Uh, 65 buses in the next of what we're talking about as a country that has 5 million, 6 million commercial vehicles is a, is a drop. Uh, I, I don't think the emphasis of our program should be acquisition of buses, no. Uh, the emphasis of this program is how do we move Nigeria to have a million natural gas vehicles in the next four years. And you can only do that by mass conversion. So we'll be rolling out a conversion incentive program in the next 60 days that will enable Nigerians to convert the vehicles to run on both PMS and uh, CNG. Uh, acquiring a few buses and distributing it for the purpose of palliative is just that. It's not uh, a core component of this program. The core component of this program is mass conversions, and that's what we're focused on. Mm. But a lot of Nigerians will remember uh, how the president addressed the nation on July 31st uh, last year, and he spoke about how uh, we're going to be rolling out CNG buses as a solution to ease the burdens created by the removal of fuel subsidies. And that's why we're having this conversation, uh, because CNG is that alternative, or at least provides an alternative, which has been said to be cheaper and all, such that people don't have to rely heavily on PMS. So you can imagine why Nigerians are, I wouldn't say impatient, to just expect what was promised. July 31st last year, it's almost a year. I remember that the president spoke about uh, making provision to invest 100 billion naira between July and March this year, July last year and March this year. For a lot of people, as I've said, that's a long time already, and they expect to see things moving really fast in that sector. But let's step back a bit. Some work is being done. I understand that the kits are being expected and will be deployed. But one question still uh, is in the air, and I wanted to address that quickly this morning. They say charity begins at home. How much uh, of an uptake do we have within government itself? I've seen private people convert their vehicles, even if we don't have as much, you know, uh, what I say, support, the stations and the rest. But in government, the, well, is it the presidential fleet, the fleet uh, for other government officials, the vehicles for ministers and the rest. If we want to cut costs, that's a brilliant way. So how much uptake do we have already? Yeah, a brilliant question. Uh, again, this is part of the work. Uh, again, in a context of where we, are, we, we have not rolled out infrastructure, uh, where there was no regulation, this was what, where we were six months ago, where there was no sufficient incentives in terms of either the vehicles being available or the cylinders or the kits 
uh, in the country, then there was paucity of adoption. But what we've done in the last six months is to enable a much more rapid adoption, and that includes adoption by government institutions. For example, in the last month, uh, we, we partnered with the Nigerian Army. We've trained about 42 Army technicians that is going to undertake the conversion of the Nigerian Army fleets. The Nigerian Army is the biggest user of diesel and PMS in the country, with operations in 36 states of the Federation. And that's a significant part of Nigeria's budget. As you can imagine, uh, Nigeria's defense budget is, I think, is about uh, 18 to 25 percent of the budget. So that's the biggest component chunk of Nigeria's government expenditure. So if you're talking about charity beginning at home, uh, we're leading with the Nigerian Army and uh, various other government institutions, the Navy, the Air Force, uh, FRS, uh, various, including government offices and ministries, are beginning to indicate a willingness to partner with us. Pardon me, uh, Mr. But our Lord kickoff Bimi. of the program with the Army in the last uh, Pardon, the last pardon me, uh, if I could just successful. quickly put this in, uh, forgive me. So that's more like charity beginning on the war front, not at home. You're talking about military, and it's brilliant to see. Well, but we were uh, there. Without, but when I mean at home, I mean in government, yeah. government officials, president, and I'm being well, particular here because well, that you would set a tone for other Nigerians that, oh, if the president's yeah. fleet has CNG vehicles, if we have the minister's cars with yeah. CNG, uh, absolutely, this is something to do. The Nigerian Army is part and parcel of Nigerian government. The president is the commander-in-chief. It has a second title. Uh, so I do not understand this is being started at the war front. No, the, the Nigerian Army is part and parcel of government. Uh, we uh, intend, and, I, and I'm very sure, uh, the president's uh, team, including ourselves, myself, uh, we will ensure that vehicles that we use, because it just makes sense. It doesn't make sense for me to be using uh, petrol at 630, 640 naira when I can buy CNG at less than 250 naira. And the car will run cheaper, run cleaner, and run, run uh, safer and more reliable. As soon as those kits are made available, again, the reality today is that in the entire country, uh, we have less than, and we've done a sense of this, in the last 60 days. We have less than 400, 500 kits available in Nigeria today, right now. Uh, so what we need to do first and foremost is to make those kits available. And that's what we are trying to ensure happens in the next 60 days. And once that becomes available, uh, government institutions, a lot of them have already raised up their hands to say they want to participate in this. Uh, uh, the, the Nigerian Army just being one of them. But for us, it makes sense that we start that engagement from the most difficult potential operational rollout, in this case the Nigerian Army, to see how, uh, number one, to ensure that their technicians are trained, they have uh, uh, workshops across the country, they are the biggest user, so if we have savings from the Nigerian Army front, then we have savings for the entire government. So uh, I, don't, I don't agree with you that the Nigerian Army is not home or the war front, the Nigerian Army is home, the Nigerian Army is working with Nigerians in 36 states of the Federation, so it's home. So we, we feel very comfortable and very happy. Uh, we've been Zaruk happy Ami. with the pilots that we've done with them. We trained 42 technicians in Lagos and in Abuja in the last two weeks. They graduated last Friday. Uh, kudos to them. Uh, they are ready to begin to implement uh, conversions as soon as those conversion kits are made available. We expect over 20,000 conversion kits in country before the end of July, and we'll begin that rollout. And I can promise you that government institutions, including my own vehicle, is going to be running on CNG. It's good to hear Mr. Alok Bemi on this particular one. Maybe piggyback on uh, what my colleague was talking about. Uh, we've seen that government at different times would say patronize Nigerian made products and all of that. Until today, we don't see uh, a presidential fleet or most of the governors and top government officials driving in any of uh, our local vehicles that are manufactured here. You just can literally count at the tip of our fingers. That's why we're poking and asking that question. Now that the CNG is here, uh, hopefully it's going to roll out pretty soon. Uh, lead by example so that it builds confidence in the mind of the people. Uh, it's not every time we see the army. They are not supposed to be seen all the time. But these politicians and the leaders of our country, we see them all the time. So if I see the president's free fleet or the governor's fleet, uh, vehicles having all of this, it builds confidence. So that's exactly what we're... And we're going to be looking out for it. And we're going to... We'll keep asking that question until we see it done, including your own vehicle, since you're the leader. Uh, but moving on, let's also say that uh, how far-reaching will this be? Because the numbers we're looking at is a great idea in the next four years, but the pressure that people are feeling is right now. Is there a way to expedite things to make sure that it actually moves the needle? 
Okay, I'll take you up on the first point. The first two buses that we deployed in right the second week after the deployment of the CNG, of the uh, announcement of the CNG program, were deployed at a state out for state out em employees. So I think we've already demonstrated sufficient faith in CNG by doing that. And I think that speaks to the fact that's the only two buses so far deployed by this program. And they were all deployed at the state out of Abuja, used by state out staff by state out employees to convey for themselves from work to uh, home every day. So that's very important to us. So I, I, I need to put that out there. So we start uh, sending the message that we believe that this is the right thing to do. And those of us in the state house are using CNG buses. That's, I hope that clears the hair. Now to the second point, how do you accelerate things? Uh, we accelerate things in three, in three ways. One, uh, the president uh, has been very gracious to expedite, to approve the expediting of uh, the procurement of those critical kits as well as uh, 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 platforms, CNG platforms, by the Federal Minister of Finance on emergency procurement. Otherwise, uh, we probably will not be expecting these items until maybe uh, early next year. Unfortunately, the current procurement law that we run is very inefficient. And uh, typically, you don't get to procurement until 9 to 12 months into the program. Uh, but because of the approval of Mr. President, we're expecting some of these just six to seven months into the program. So I think uh, that's one thing we need to keep doing, at least for the next four years, to ensure that we can uh, get these items on time. But secondly, we can also expedite matters by engaging the private sector. Like I said, the government by itself alone cannot potentially buy all the conversion kits, like the one million conversion kits that Nigerians need to convert a million vehicles that will save us $2 billion yearly uh, in the next four years. We need the private sector to come in. And what we needed to do was to ensure that we have a very clear regulatory framework so that the private sector, sector can invest. Uh, not just framework for conversion, but framework for refueling, framework for CNG processing, framework for gas sourcing and supply. All of these, all the way from end to end of the value chain, from nozzle to pump, as we say, we needed to develop a regulatory framework that will enable investment. And that includes incentive programs like the duty waiver and the exemptions that Mr. President has now given. This is very critical uh, uh, to expedite the uh, adoption of CNG across the country. But last but not the least is that we also require injection of development funding, especially from the point of view of the infrastructure. We need infrastructure for, uh, uh, for CNG distribution in the country. We need virtual pipelines, we need trucks, we need refueling stations, about 3,000 of them. We need mini LNGs across the 36 states of the Federation. We need uh, uh, critical investment uh, funding for pipelines, uh, the AKK pipeline to land in Kano, distribution pipeline to go to the northeast and northwest and across the country to land critical gas across the country that allows processing stations, CNG motor stations to then be developed. These Critical development and infrastructure funding is also required. And I think, uh, as you see in the with a renewed hope invest, uh, infrastructure fund, that will then be able to come in into the CNG program. Because transportation is one of the critical sectors that the RHIF is supposed to invest in. So you can see end to end that uh, the Mr. President is committed, he's passionate about uh, Nigeria's transition to CNG. Uh, he's passionate about Nigeria's transition of the transportation sector to cheaper, safer, more reliable energy. And that is why he's doing all the things he's doing, right from the point of view of expediting uh, procurement uh, of the uh, catalyst items, assets, I, I call them, because really those are just a very small drop in the ocean that is required, but also ensuring and enabling the necessary regulation that allows the private sector to come in to do the quantum investment that is necessary to move us forward and also enabling I, the infrastructure investment. That we allow Indeed, Mr. Oluwagbemeta, it's an ambitious program uh, that, uh, you know, it's a giving that you require the engagement of the private sector. And I see that there's, there's been some activity in that regard in the last few days. Uh, and that is why we hope that Nigeria can follow the example of China by expanding local capacity and ensuring that even if we do not have a manufacturing component of uh, uh, electric vehicles or CNG powered vehicles, at least there is an assembly component. We hope that, you know, that assembling comp component can be engaged to also uh, intervene or uh, uh, make available the CNG buses. But conversion is certainly not cheap. According to reports, Nigerians need about 300 to 600,000 Naira to convert their vehicles from 
PMS to CNG. And there's a 130 billion Naira provision, if I'm not mistaken, for that. Um, is there a, a loan component out of this budget to en enable Nigerians at the lower rung of the ladder to be able to convert their vehicles? Yeah, so uh, speaking about industrial capacity, let me treat the first part of the question. Uh, we recognize that uh, going forward, we cannot continue to depend on importation. Uh, we can't go from importing petrol and diesel and PMS to importing uh, kits, cylinders, and uh, the necessary components for vehicle conversion to create the natural gas vehicle industry in Nigeria. So we're already working with our partners at uh, the Nigerian uh, midstream, uh, downstream gas infrastructure fund to develop an industrial park uh, that will have manufacturers of these critical components uh, uh, do their manufacturing in Nigeria. And we hope that this will be kicked off sometimes before the end of the year. But the conversations have already started. Uh, the private sector partners have been mobilized. Investment have been mobilized for this purpose. And we know that this is a critical component of the work. We hope eventually that you're already uh, under the first phase of the uh, implementation of the uh, palliative on by the Ministry of Finance, they had prioritized Nigerian manufacturers in terms of assembly of CNG vehicles, tricycles, and the rest of them. But of course, we also want to extend that beyond those assets to conversion, because at the end of the day, like I said, this program really, really, really uh, scales when you convert a large number of existing vehicles. We already have over 12 million vehicles running in Nigeria, and five of them, a million of those, are commercial vehicles. Uh, we want to see a substantial number of those running on CNG. We do not need to go and buy new CNG vehicles, as the case may be, just less than uh, $600, uh, about 500, 300, or 400,000 era. Most of these vehicles will conveniently run on a fuel that is 40, 50% cheaper than PMS and diesel. So that's what we want to do at scale. And that requires us right. to manufacture the cylinders, for example, which are very critical uh, in, in Nigeria to manufacture the conversion right. kits, to manufacture the uh, computer module that uh, drives the injection of, uh, of CNG into the, into the vehicle uh, combustion system, side-by-side -side PMS. So all of those things can be manufactured in Nigeria. So we believe that Nigeria can awaken our manufacturing capacity. And we're working with the Ministry of Steel, we're working with the Ministry of Transportation, and I, uh, I, we spoke to this uh, three weeks ago when we launched the Army program. Okay. And that plan is on course. And I believe that you'll be seeing more of this. And as we roll out our details and plans for local manufacturing for this right, Mark, program. That said. Mr. Mark, yeah. uh, we just have 30 seconds. If you could just uh, land on your thoughts in 30 seconds. We're totally out of time. All right. Uh, the, 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 the second component of, 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 that, of that question uh, as, as, as just to do with the overall adoption of, uh, of CNG itself and expediting it and all of, all of what not. I think ultimately it will depend on you and I. It will depend on Nigerians uh, believing that we should use our own natural resource to actually develop this country. And that requires our own commitment, uh, either in terms of our Naira and our Kobo. But the federal government will help. The conversion incentive program will be rolled out in the next 60 days uh, that will enable critical sectors of the economy to assess Absolutely. this conversion, for example, at a discounted price. Uh, this includes mass transit sector, ride share owners, uh, institutions, governments, as you, as you already mentioned. And slowly but surely, as we get additional appropriation, right, so additional funding right. available, we can expand it to general public. I, I, know, I know that you have a lot to say about this. And we're all curiously waiting for it. We have enough gas reserve in the country from the publication uh, by the commission. So we must thank you for coming on the program, Mr. Michael Luagbemi, Program Director, Chief Executive of Presidential CNG Initiative. We're looking forward to this uh, as, as, as soon as possible. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We'll come back after this break. We're shifting gears. The president actually declared April the 7th National Police Day. What does that mean to, for the police force and for all of us who deserve? We'll explain all of that. The guests will join us to tell us what it is. Join us again. We are upgrading your equipment and technology to enhance operational effectiveness and efficiency. This includes acquiring fit for purpose equipment, weapons, ammunition, and armored carriers to provide cover and protection for officers in combat situations. The 7th of April is hereby declared National Police Day in Nigeria.
10 days ago was the National Police Day, but of course, the pronouncement wasn't made up until two days ago. So from April the 7th next year, uh, Nigerians will be celebrating or commemorating National Police Day. That statement was made at the uh, Police Awards and the Vice President, who represented the President, uh, made that particular statement as you saw there. But what does this mean really, particularly for our security? And I think it provides us yet another opportunity uh, to talk about that all important conversation of security, particularly policing in Nigeria, which has been quite a thorny issue over the past uh, few decades. We have joining us on the program to walk through uh, that conversation, Mr. Alfred Anonibu, Forensic and Criminal Intelligence Specialist, MD Bell Protocol and Security Support Services Limited, uh, wears a number of hats. Fellow Chartered Institute of Forensic Investigation Professionals and Fellow Chartered Forensic Fraud Investigators of Nigeria joins us virtually on the program. Good morning, uh, Mr. Anonibu. Good morning, and uh, it's always my pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. I know you are forensically looking at that uh, pronouncement. April 7th uh, is our National Police Day. So speak to us. Uh, how does this change maybe the optics? How does it change things in any way? Having a National Police Day, a day set aside to celebrate our police and you know talk about the issues that affect them, which, by the way, is a lot. So for you, what do you see? Yeah, um, let me first of all appreciate the men of the Nigerian Police Services. Um, you know, often um, the police are often viewed from not too encouraging perspective by most Nigerians because they do not know the situations and circumstances under which they seek to deliver their services. So let's um, appreciate them, and I, I, I really do. And I want to thank the IG for hyping and bringing up this initiative at this time. Um, preceding the, the National Police Day was the Police Week, which usually is from the 1st of April to the 7th. So every first week of the year is uh, they commemorate and you know mark the Police Week. And I would also want to appreciate from the depth of my being Mr. President, for the pronouncement they made about the National Police Day, the 7th of every April, um, this is commendable. There is this saying that when you appreciate the little people do, you motivate them to seek to do more. And I think this must be accepted and recognized to be the right steps in the right direction. This is commendable. This is worth celebrating. It will give the Nigerian policemen and women a sense of a sense of importance that the entire nation have set aside a day to remember, recognize, and appreciate their contribution um, their contributions to our national safety. Um, this is awesome, and uh, it's commendable. You know, Mr. Ananubo, uh, it, it is indeed, you know, it's difficult to argue with you on that one, particularly with the police awards that were, was held recently, you know, and perhaps that will go a long way to um, increase the morale within the force. But some would say that really this is majoring in the minor where we have a police force that is lagging behind in the area of... Um, intelligence in the area of deterrence of crime and criminality criminality particularly you know insurgency tackling insurgency and banditry in nigeria's northeast and northwest uh, shouldn't uh, the energies of the government be channeled in that area such that you know there'll be a great reduction of our dependence on the armed forces uh you know which as we continue to say, is overwhelmed, you know, with the intervention in that area, and we see, you know, a force that is more competent with tackling these um, uh, security concerns. Well, I, I think we must recognize that the Nigerian police service, as presently constituted, are extremely overwhelmed, and the reason being that there is so much poverty, and poverty is like a fertilizer that breeds crime. So when the entire society 
are plagued by this debt of uh, uncertainty in basic sustenance. You expect people to explore opportunities, take advantages, and breach basic rules, which translates to crime in any society. So we are also overassessing our police capacity. We are drawing these men and women from our society. Some didn't join the police because they saw a career in the police service. Some, most people probably joined the police because uh, they wish to find a job. They want to find something they could use to sustain and keep themselves going. So I don't want us to take our eyes away from those facts. When we are looking at the challenge or challenges being faced by the Nigerian police service in delivering their duties of protections of life and pro properties, uh, having said that, we also must take into account that we have politicians whose span of involvement ranges between four to eight years. And for a, for a nation in a peculiar kind of situation, that is a very dangerous platform because while they are coming in, they are thinking of recovering from the elections. They are now looking at you know the next election within four years, and then possibly they get second term and they're on their way out. So you find that we have not been able to nurture, cultivate the political will consistent with patriotic aspirations as a people. So the, 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 the system does not give us room to have or harvest quality people that can handle the challenges of building a, a, a sustainable police system. So that is very critical in our consideration. But that is not to make excuse that the police have not been able to, you know, benchmark their 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 their, their, their duties and their obligations to the nation in terms of dealing with uh, the, the issues of intelligence, issues of uh, manpower development, issues of engagement, and all that. So we have this complex mix that's confronting the the performance and the activities of the Nigerian police. And also the, the difficulty they have in dealing with the quality of men we have in our political class. Now, you can't get clean water, like I always say, from a poison pool. Our politicians come from our society. Our policemen come from our society. So you can understand that we are coming from a shared value, shared you know, challenges. And um, it takes sincerely um, professionalism and exposure for people to cultivate that sense of okay let me go give it do it for the land do it for the nation it's not about me so there, there are challenges but i think we start somewhere we we've started the president has started by recognizing that this institution has so much to give and have given a lot they've lost men they have a lot of challenges they go through, they have challenges with equipment, training opportunities, internal issues, and the quality of people they also have in their rank and file in leadership. Because it's not just about the, 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 the institution of the police service, but also the people running the system. Some of them come with baggages. Some are coming from ethnic or political or religious, you know, privileges. And they bring these things to the service. So they, they become challenges, they become, you know, issues they deal with internally. And these things affect their output. It affects the quality, it affects their, their commitment to run investigations without bias, without pressure. You know, there are situations they arrest people, somebody makes it just a phone call, and they have to begin to think of the safety of their jobs. So these are elements we might probably deal with over time depending on the type of leadership we have in our nation. But um, we must appreciate that we've come to accept that there is a 7th April, which is marked as the police day. And um, we hope that it will not just be another talk show we do with these days, but we will be able to review the two sides, what the government is doing to ensure that they are, the country is policed, the content we are building into these men to ensure that we have capable and well-qualified professionals that will enforce our laws. 
And also even the lawmakers should be able to provide incentives that can motivate people who love this country to want to serve this country in the police service. All right. I know that in America, I think in May, they've been celebrating this since the 60s. I think National Police Memorial Day also, that's what it's called there, to highlight the concerns of the police force, as well as, you know, remember the men who have laid their lives down in, in the line of duty. And so I want you to speak further to the police force in this particular context, because this is like um, their own Armed Forces Remembrance Day, which is quite popular on January 15th every year right here in Nigeria. So for them, how can they make the most of this particular um, day to, to call attention of government and everybody in authority to ensure that their needs and their welfare is sorted? Because that's a big issue, which is why Bukola was saying it appears like majoring on the minor because their welfare is critical uh, at the end of the day to be able to provide the kind of service we expect from our police force. Because at some point, you know, they drop the ball. And that's why we have a lot of the army intervening in civilian issues. Well, we, you know, this is Nigeria, and uh, we are special in the way we do things. Most times, we don't want to build up to, you know, a, a, a goal. We like to respond to crises. We, we make statements when things are bad and down. But I would want to think that um, we, we, we need to trust God for a generation of men and women who can join the service um, purely for patriotic motives, uh, not because they are ethnically inclined or privileged or religiously advantaged. You see, the America we often mention, uh, uh, quote most times, is a society where patriotism ranks first. America comes first. And the same way you can use this patriotism to mislead the people, it's also the way you can use the patriotism to direct the people right. Um, we must not forget that policemen are Nigerians. So whatever affects most Nigerians impacts on the police service because they live with us, they go to the same markets. They, so if we are going to do anything, we must think beyond police as an establishment. We must look at the general society. We must, you know, the office of the citizens of Nigeria must become paramount. And that office accommodates everybody. That office has been missing in the polity of this nation. Of course, when events and ceremonies come, we mention it, but we have not been able to create and sustain the office of the citizens of Nigeria. We have Nigerians who don't have an office. But when you talk of the office of the president, you can see the glory, the candor, the pomp, the pageantry. You talk of the senior president. People die to get into this because these are few spots where people are given statesmanship, not the nationhood. So we are not building often the nation as a people. And that is what is affecting the quality and content of men we deploy to different services. So we need to rethink and our, our system needs to review this. When we promote citizenship, people will die for the country. They want to protect the country, whether as a policeman in the UK or other countries, it's not only police that serves the people. Elderly people will tell you the color of a car they saw at a particular time in a location. And that will give police the clue that the crime that was committed must have been committed by a car carrying this number. They profile the, the information and arrive at an intelligence that helps them to, to succeed. But where we create offices and not people, that is dangerous. It is very, um, it, it is not profitable for the entire country. So few people benefit because they are able to access those platforms. So I'm looking at using this to make it a situation where Nigerians are built. Infrastructures will come with the, the specified content, not papers, you know. So when we have this and we are drawing men who are benefiting from the quality, from the system, to join any services, including the police. The attitude to duty will be, you cannot undermine the laws of the land. You cannot compromise, irrespective of your position. We don't celebrate individuals, we celebrate people. That orientation is what we are going to trust could help us. But if it's about 
talking about training, buying equipment, and you are handing it to disgruntled people, to insecure people, people who are not even sure that they will be in the same place tomorrow. You can, because you didn't do what somebody like, they'll transfer you as punishment to somewhere. No law protects you. You can be dismissed from service. You can be sick. Nobody comes to look for you. Some are wounded uh, in the line of duty. There are no benefits. And even if they come, sometimes they are tampered with. No system fights and protects these people. Right. So we need to look at these systemic things. Right. So when we have them working, now if we make any promises to the police, I can assure you it will stand. But when the system, the delivery system is sick, is not functional, is not effective, can be tinkered by anybody, you come right. and change it. Um, those are issues. So policies must be supported by realities on ground. Mr. Donabu, absolutely. We need to really empower our police. And that's quite ironic because they should also have those powers responsibly, that is. And it's a very tricky balance again. And this conversation can go on for a long time. But quickly, I want you to speak to uh, what is usually... Uh, well, I say the look and feel of the police, which also contributes to how they are perceived uh, in the public. We can, we've spoken about uh, welfare and the rest. How can you arm someone with AK-47 and you're not paying the person good enough salary and you know, the rest? But on the flip side is a lot of people see the police in Nigeria carrying AK-47s, for example. And, you know, there's already that fear, that barrier. It feels like this is a war situation. You have a lot of people coming to the country and they see our police with AK-47s and they're asking you, what is going on? I've never seen police in my own country. They tell you that they don't see police in their country even bearing arms or they are concealed. So they are shocked when they see our police with AK-47 or, or, you know, basically those kinds of weapons. So is that something we should also look into? Is there a thinking behind that? Um, maybe that can also help to improve things. Well, just in line with what I'm saying, we need to we need to have a national reorientation on our perception about the police. Even the police themselves should be able to help themselves. Uh, the reason being that we've held very strongly negative notions about the police service, probably because of their conduct, because of their you know some unprofessional behaviors and all that. And um, there is a deep distrust between an average Nigerian. In my job, I've encountered people who just to come to police when there are crimes or situations that requires coming to the police to make mere statements to collaborate that a, a, a crime was committed in their neighborhood. And they will say to you, no, I don't want to have anything to do with the police. Nigerians must change that orientation. We must own our police. The police must belong to us. And I think the police must build that bridge. Nigerians also must be able to build a bridge to cross over to the police. Right now, there's no trust. Nigerians don't trust the police. And unfortunately, the policemen are Nigerians. There is a very deep distrust even among themselves, partly because of the way people are being treated, partly because of things being managed wrongly. But we need that. Um, the AK-47 is an assault-graded weapon. It's not meant to be carried around, except we have extreme threats that requires deployment of such weapons. Unfortunately, it has become a regular, normal part of the kit of an average policeman. You can't see most policemen, in fact, you can hardly see a policeman with light weapons. They move around freely with AK-47. The question is, are we at war? Yes, we are. We have moral wars. We have distrust. There is deep sense of enmity, not spoken, but in, in conduct between Nigerians and those that are meant to protect them. And sometimes the way some Nigerians are treated. And then finally, the media. The media must help build a good reputation for both Nigerians and the police. You see, people take to what they hear. Many times, these things are unsubstantiated. But it's easy. I watched a clip this morning, a young man playing prank on people. And he will approach them and say, they are shooting there, they are shooting there. Even people with arms, we start running because we have gotten used to rumors, hearsays, and that has molded the way we perceive these services. So Nigerians need 
serious reorientation and that it must be driven by the police in their character at the station, the way they receive and treat Nigerians. We take people, we take there are police stations across the country where you walk in, you get properly received by the DPO, but you will be wrongly treated by the people at the counter. And it is taken out on the police. You get treated wrongly by you know, a, a man that has chosen to exhibit indiscipline, but because he's wearing police uniform, people will conclude that that's the way police are. So these orientations must be aggressively driven. The change must come from also within the police. Mm. There must be punitive measures for anybody that violates the rights of Nigerians. But there must be severe penalties for any Nigerian that, you know, that you know, uh, disrespects or breaches the privileges and rights of a Nigerian police, policeman. There should be no room for sacred cows. Mm. If you, if you, if you insult or disrespect a police the officer, important points that you that you make there, and it's they're, they're quite difficult to contest, uh, Mr. Honourable. But earlier on, you also made some critical points that I'd like to follow up. You talked about the importance of offices and the need for policies to be in line with what's on ground in terms of realities. Speaking of which, how important, how strong is the Office of the Police Service Commission and uh, the Ministry of Police Affairs to demand better funding for the welfare needs of the Nigeria police force? But certainly, if they are doing excellently well, we'll be feeling their impact. And it has to do with who they put in those offices. I don't want to mention names, but I know that we've had uh, chairman of police service commissions who we are up and doing. We've also had those that gave ceremonial patronage for either supporting politicians or whatever. Um, some of these establishments must be carefully um, assessed and then people being given responsibilities must be by merit. It shouldn't be by any other consideration because police is the life of our society. It's police that keeps Nigeria moving. I know the army is there, the immigration, they have other services, which I highly respect and commend their roles. But the police takes the bullets every day. So we need to look at putting men based on merits to some of these offices based on antecedents, based on track records, so that we don't have people ceremonially, ceremonially occupying offices, but they are incap incompetent, they are incapable of even interpreting basic security. I, I, I did something funny recently, and I asked somebody, I said, by the way, what is the meaning of police? You are a police officer. And he said, oh, police, well, we are for protection of life. I said, no, I mean the definition. The police is an acronym for public officers, for legal investigations and criminal emergencies. And if you take that home, people know that I'm a legal officer, a public officer. My duties are for legal investigations and criminal emergencies so they can define their existence. Now, when we don't have content, you just do the usual window dressing. Well, Mr. 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 time. The, the entire country, you know, we take this as a project. So we don't lose Let's sight of some of the important move. points you have made. I, I mean, it's really instructive. You've given Nigerians uh, the full form of the word, well, now acronym, police. So it's not just police, police, police. It actually means something. Public officer for legal investigations and criminal emergencies. So if our viewer does not remember any other thing about this conversation, at least you remember... <laughs> <laughs> what police means. But, you know, we'd like to thank you so much, Mr. Alfred and Nongo. Quite an interesting conversation around, you know, that critical part of our security architecture and our society, the police. Mr. Alfred and Nongo, forensic and criminal intelligence specialist, thank you so much for forensically dealing with this conversation. It's always my pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. We'll take a moment now, and when we return, uh, we'll talk art. You might see Bukola get to do some painting, or even Jeffrey. Maybe you mean, but we're talking art uh, this morning. The kind that gets you inspired, just takes you to a different world. That's in a few seconds. So stay with us on the morning.
Welcome back to the program. So, amid the myriad of challenges, how do you stay inspired? Or what's, where's the, the, the inspiration on the, your list of economies of scale? Is it even there at all? And does it speak to why, um, you know, art is expensive, according to what Jeffrey said earlier on on the program? Well, we have somebody to answer that question for us, who is doubly gifted, as we told you, Earlier on, Mr. Ayo Kunli Komolafe, visual artist and poet, joins us on the program. Welcome to the Morning Brief. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Sure. So, you're a visual artist yes. and you're a poet. Yes. Which comes first for you? Well, I, I, I think I was born a visual artist. <laughs> and I developed my poetry along the way. So, well, as, but as, as at now, I'm both. So, which is more important for you? Both are important to me, so because I use my art to express myself, I use my poetry to express myself, and at the same time, I promote poets. You know, there was a time I had this show on radio and I was promoting poets every week. So that's how important uh, my art and my poetry are to me. So why is it that um, art is always... That you guys love to embedded in mystique. So we can't just see something and talk about it for the face value. There has to be some level of interpretation. Why, why, is, it that, why is it that way? I think uh, being mystique is, is relative, you know, because we have different types of art. We have representative art, we have abstract art. So sometimes when you see an abstract representation, an abstract work, what it will tell you, or the way it speaks to you, is different from the way it will speak to her. You know, that's why sometimes you see someone that you see a work that you think that, well, what was in it? What was there? And someone is ready to pay millions, you know, to get that job, that, that type of artwork. So it's, it's, it's relative, it depends on how you perceive that uh, piece of work. So the mysticism uh, has a role to play in this viability economically, right? Not really. You know, it's, 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 I think it's like when they say that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. You know, it depends on how you connect with that, that work. That beauty is expensive. Exactly, you know, because art, uh, from the onset, art is, uh, you know, in the Western world, is is connected to the court practices, to the royalty. So. I think even in Africa, if you go to Benin, most of the art, art uh, commission were by the, the palace, you know, the palace of the Oba of Benin, even in Ife, you know, most of these artwork are associated with people of means, you know, so... Not commons. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. that, that's the reason why many people think that art is expensive. It's not actually expensive if you have the money to buy it. You know, it's like a piece of <laughs> a piece of like it. Because right? um, expensive is really uh, subjective. Exactly. A uh, million dollars to someone which is expensive is just chicken change exactly. to another person. And, you know, if you check hierarchy of needs, particularly for a lot of Nigerians, <laughs> art is maybe, just, <laughs> maybe not even on that, that pyramid, really. But, you know, this morning I, I woke up thinking, where is Lagbaja? Okay. Where has Lagbaja been? And I'm going somewhere. Lagbaja's art, there's that mystic, it's, uh, there's the enigma around it. There's a mix of a lot of things, love, there's a political angle. Mm -hmm. Just the, you know, the, the, the well-rounded artist Lagbaja is. But as far as I know, Lagbaja's songs are not playing on rotation on, on radio anymore. In fact, I asked someone randomly about one of Lagbaja's songs this morning. I just sang it. I was like, who sang that? <laughs> so how well do we appreciate art in Nigeria? Particularly, um, as, as I said, in the context of the Nigeria we're in, how well would you say we really appreciate art as people? Okay, well, in, in some circle, there are, there are some people that pay so much to acquire artwork, you know, but when we talk about the larger society, it's the, the appreciation is low. I think maybe because of what he said about the price, the pricing, and uh, also the materials that we use for these artworks are also expensive. Most, most of them are imported. And even the, when you consider the time that you, you know, invest in creating these works, you 
may not want to part with it, you know, with little any little amount of money because you also need to create more to be inspired. Mm. You know, as when you are not getting value for what you are creating, it, you know, it demoralizes you and may affect, you know, what you do. But in Nigeria, I think the the reception is growing. It, it now depends on the uh, the the, the yeah. society, the oh. circle that you belong to. You know, if you are in the among the people that appreciate it, you discover that so many people are patronizing artists. They are acquiring works. And they go for art exhibitions. And exactly, the art exhibition, visit galleries, and and also when foreigners visit. That's another avenue for artists to mm. sell their artworks and also through exhibitions and foreign views, auctions and the rest. Well, speak to us about this vital point. What is art meant to achieve? What is it meant to do to me? Because I can just see what someone else calls art. Yes. And I don't see art. I see waste of space. By the way, I don't see waste of space. I'm just giving an example. <laughs> yeah. So what is art meant to achieve? Is it meant to... Uh, well, I don't want to preempt your response, but at the heart of art, yes, what is art meant to do? I won't say to the heart. Yes. Okay, it's as if I know that you are going to ask me that question. So I put down some things, you know, to educate the public. You know, because art is not just drawing or painting. It has, number one, is the is an emotional. Uh, expression of the artist you know it's what is a name that is trying to express out there and the way it feels you see some artworks they you look at them you know that you are feeling sad some you feel happy it depends on the color the hues you know the 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 subject that is representing that is mm. working on and also it's also a an avenue to preserve culture right you know most of the time we see an artwork would say, oh, this is Beniat. This artwork is from Ife. This is Iboku. And we see an artwork, we say, this is an Egyptian art. It preserves culture sure. and we're able to connect with our past. Exactly. It's because of those artists. If this is Benin art, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can see, because when you just saw it, you would see the representation yeah. of Benin kingdom. And also, apart from aesthetic appreciation, people love it. It's it, it uh, lightens up to say a uh, uh, space. Uh, you notice that uh, most of the time, uh, the, there's something that happened yesterday, the uh, stock exchange in Denmark that got burnt. There's something that was said on the news that people rushed in to preserve the artworks, mm. you know, because of the value that they place on those, mm. uh, those works. So those are, are also it's about social commentary. You know, when you look at the sleeves of fella albums of old, they are artworks and they're actually talking about what is happening in the society. Mm. And also it's also about historical documentation. We are talking about cave art, how, how the uh, early men, how they were living their, their, their lives, they documented it in on the caves, in the drawings, and all those things. So it's about historical documentation, mm -hmm. and apart from economic impact that the country uh, can earn from. And you know, we could go on talking about yes. that. <laughs> and even ask, you know, what's the traffic like at our museums? You know, do you have that huge market of connoisseurs going to um, art galleries, you know, to uh, look at exhibitions, you know, we go on and on. Uh, but, but let's move on to the poetry aspect of it. Okay. And, and I have a question for you, but I, I don't think that we have time. But you, we have time enough for you to read some of your poetry for us. So uh, perhaps we could wrap up on that one. Okay, let me read this one. It's titled On Tango. Life is a moving train, moving endlessly to an unknown, unknown future. We are all its passengers, boarding and alighting with our needless baggage. We keep our heads high or low, depending on our numerous encounters. In the journey of life, the voyage can be so sweet mm -hmm. or bitter as it may. The storm can be so rough or we pass through a calm street, regardless of what we find, no situation has ever been permanent. 
Every moment of our life slips into an unending story, story that is being written as a guide for our future beings. So no matter what life brings, remember it's just a face. Happiness, they say, is a choice you make. Therefore, let's lose your troubles. Let them be washed down the stream. Keep your mind at rest and put all trust in God. The purpose of your life is bigger than your worries. Learn to be at peace. Live each day as it comes. The issue of life is like a fishing net. You feel, you feel at ease when you make it your choice to let God untangle your beat. Hmm. Um, Interesting. <laughs> if I'm correct. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, what, what, what more do we need to add? It's beautiful, but <laughs> just a strict question. What right. inspired that? Uh, what inspired it was actually a program that we had in church that's called Untangle. And I decided to write something about it that we are going through so much in the world because we worry so much. But if we allow God to just take charge, we discover that what we were thinking that is trouble yesterday will become testimony today. Mm. So. Yeah, it's so beautiful because if we had time, there's something we wanted, we wanted you to do. Because if you look at Nigeria now, we have the good, the bad, the ugly. All right. The Naira is fighting back record, <laughs> record strength <laughs> while true. the inflation is on record high. So we wanted to see how your, you know, enigma uh, that you en enigmatically allow me to use that word <laughs> represent all of that in poetry as well as in your, in your drawing. But we don't have time right. for that now. All right, all right Rumors. Thank you very much for uh, very much being for on the program, you. Mr. Ayo Kunle yes. uh, Kamalafe, visual art and poet. Thank you so much for your inspiration Thank you, on the program Thank today. You, so, if um, inspiration, if art was not on your economies of scale, after listening to that poem, we hope that we've been able to convince you <laughs> to live untangled. Thank you so much for being on the program today. Join us again tomorrow. I am Bukola Koka. It was time, it was a great time to listen to that beautiful piece by the gentleman who just delivered it for us right here. And of course, I hope you're writing yours to change the narrative of Nigeria for the better. Thank you for watching. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Well, happiness, they say, is a choice you make. So go out there, be happy, and make someone happy. I'm Karadoki Kulu. Goodbye. <laughs>